joined us tonight. Uh, welcome to everybody. And um, I'm so happy to be doing the a series of fireside chats um, as a part of a transition after 10 years of leadership here at Congregation Kul Shofar um, and preparing for a new chapter in my life yet to be determined, um, but such a, a rich and important time for reflection um, in kind of these areas of passion and legacy that have been a part of my rabbinate during this time here at Kul Shofar. And so what we've done is I've invited um, people to be in conversation with tonight. We are talking specifically about congregation-based community organizing and uh, looking at the faces on the screen. Many people here tonight are familiar with that, but there may be some who aren't. Um, and so as we progress with the fireside chat, I'll kind of keep an eye on who's in the room and share some more broad information for people who um, for whom that would be helpful. Just a reminder that we have um, people here tonight, and I'll introduce shortly, from a Marin Organizing Committee and also from 1LA, both of whom are affiliated with Industrial Areas Foundation, um, which is an international organization that provides, I mean, it does a lot of things. It's hard to summarize it in a couple of sentences, but it connects all of us through general principles and passions and disciplines to try to make the world a better place through um, the long haul, right? Staying in for the long haul. So um, I also want to acknowledge uh, one of our organizers, Liz Hall from Marin Organizing Committee, mm -hmm. who's here tonight. So Liz, it's wonderful to see you. Mm -hmm. And um, we also want to introduce Rabbi Dara Frimmer, Senior Rabbi of Temple Isaiah in Los Angeles, and Janet Hirsch, a member of Temple Isaiah, who's going to share about her journey as well tonight and Mark Swayskin, a member of Congregation Kul Shofar here in Tiburon, um, who will be speaking from his perspective. Um, so I am really fortunate to have met Dara back in, oh wow, 2006, 2007? Definitely 2007, I got here in July. Okay, and I started at 2006 as assistant rabbi at Temple Bethel in Los Angeles, and so I knew it was in that ballpark, yep. um, and so, you know, tonight is a really great example of being able to reach um, into this um, treasure trove kind of, of memories and relationships that I have. And to reach out and to say, hey, Dara, we haven't talked for a, more than a couple of years, but we know we share this in common. That's the incredible advantage of being a part of an international organization that has a, a structured approach and principles and values to how we organize mm -hmm. and how we act in the world. And so it felt so great to reach out to you. And then you... Mm -hmm brought in Janet and I brought in Mark and here we all are. So I want to start with asking you, Dara, how you got involved in organizing. And then we're going to have a little round robin to hear from others as well. Sounds perfect. And thank you for hosting Janet and me. It's great. Uh, so uh, I came at organizing through being a rabbi. Um, and and, I, and Janet will be able to talk as a congregant, sort of these different perspectives. I had come from New York City where I worked as a rabbinical student in many <laughs> congregations, all of them committed to social justice. Um, I arrived for my first sort of significant position as an assistant rabbi at Temple Isaiah. And that year we invited Jonah Pesner, a, a consummate organizer, incredible justice pursuer, uh, to come and be a major speaker. And he introduced us to 1LA, one of the Industrial Areas Foundation's um, hubs in Los Angeles. So we met organizers for the first time right as I was starting. And the question that they posed was number one, what keeps you up at night? What agitates you? Where, where is not just I care about an issue like the environment, but what is that connection between everyone in theory could care about the environment? Why do you, Dara, care about the environment? And introduce the idea of really digging into personal experience and memory to understand 
what actually I was most concerned, fearful, angry, agitated about, um, rather than even just what the politically correct answer might have been in that moment. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and then, then the, what was reflected back as a rabbi was, um, how many times have you been frustrated in your brief exposure as a rabbi trying to do justice when you say, everyone told me they cared about this issue and two people showed up? Or everyone said, we'll be there. Uh, but ultimately what they meant was we'll be there for 10 minutes. And can you have the most meaningful part be conveniently located in the exact hours that I have available? Um, and so what organizing presented for the first time was there are pathways for direct service. There are pathways for, you know, showing up in the capital. There are pathways for education. Um, but there also has to be a pathway in which we relearn how to tell an authentic story from our past that we didn't even realize was the motivator for why we care about this issue in the present, and then begin to look at how we elicit other people's stories and hold them accountable when they tell us something that is true or painful or inspiring about what they really care about in the world. And then you circle back and you don't send an email that says, hey, we're all getting together. You should come do this. So we, we say to the person, I remember the story that you told me about what it was like to grow up adjacent to poverty and how that scared you. The issue that we are working on right now touches on that memory. I think you would have a place and a role and a voice. Will you join me? And that power of actually now organizing people around story and then showing people that their private issues are in fact public and shared issues was revolutionary. Um, and that's what got me hooked was I wanted to I wanted to know that my legacy was that I would do justice in the world and help other people do justice and organizing opened up a whole new set of vocabulary and tools and resources that I hadn't had previously. So I was in and that's how I got to meet Janet. <laughs> Janet, do you remember what hooked you on organizing? I do, I do remember. It was so funny. Um, <clears throat> I grew up uh, in Zimbabwe and had gone to very nice uh, Anglican schools. And so my children, I was determined were going to go to public school. I thought it was the best thing about America. And I just absolutely loved it. My son was about to have his bar mitzvah. So I had one foot firmly out the door. And I got an email saying, do you care about public education? And instead of hitting delete, which is I normally do, I went, yeah, I care about public education. It was something I cared about deeply. And I went to Isaiah. And obviously now, in hindsight, I realized it was a house meeting. But I think there that the things that I had been told all my life to push down this anger, this, this inability to stand how the inequities in life, right, was kind of encouraged. You know, I had to learn to tamp it down a bit. I sometimes flamed a little too hot. Um, and so that was how I came to it. So I fell in love with the IAF. I like to, you know, I, I've been a member of Isaiah for many, many years, but I fell in love with Isaiah through the IAF. Where as I fell in love with 1LA, I really did. I, I just found the people so clever. I, it gave me a language. And I felt that this was something that I could really do. And then I went to training, which I'm sure many of you have been to like drinking from a fire hose and then you go and have a nap for the afternoon and then you drink from another fire hose. And we had um, a training on the power of, of institutions and it was like a light bulb went off for me because I'd never really had an institution in my life before. My parents didn't go to church, boarding school really not. We don't jo join fraternities at university in, you know, in South Africa where I went to university. So, and I suddenly realized, mm, I'm not that interesting if I don't have Temple Isaiah in my, in my, you know, my realm. That I, so very strategically decided I was going to make myself important at Temple Isaiah. And, uh, and that's what I did. I, I joined uh, over 55 group. I joined anything, anybody would have me basically. Helped form our Kai village, got on the board, and then am now the executive vice president of social justice but the chair of our core organizing team at isaiah so that's my sort of origin story mark how about yours um that's a lovely story um i had already lived in moran and was a member of kosho far but 
um, spent most of my time in San Francisco because my office was there. And when I moved my office to Marin, I thought this is really time for me to get to know uh, not only the cultural far community better, but my local community. And I was originally drawn to what's sometimes called relational Judaism, the sacred experience of meeting people, panim el panim, face to face and heart to heart. And it was very moving to me. And then I became interested in uh, learning how to organize. And I quickly saw really what you were describing, Janet, about how powerful the stories are and also how effective we could be on many issues that matter to the community. I was really startled by it. And uh, so that's sort of a brief version of how I got involved in it. And uh, before talking about the issues that we've worked on in MOC and what we've accomplished, um, Janet, I'd like to circle back to you and ask what issues One LA has been working on and how that's been going. Sure. So I'm sure you were all very proud of the work that we did during the pandemic around uh, voter protections and expanding the California Earned Income Tax Credit. And launched out of that <clears throat> uh, retreat that we had with California IAF leaders, we undertook to do research actions on the areas, well, first of all, to have house meetings. So we had over 100 house meetings, thousands of conversations to find out what our um, communities cared about. And it came up to uh, mental health, housing and homelessness, criminal justice, and those were what we started researching. That's not where we ended up. Where we ended up was mental health, housing and homelessness, mm -hmm. healthcare deserts, which is what we, we identify as these areas where there's just low ability to access the healthcare you need for, for a variety of reasons. And then what really has resonated with Isaiahs um, is the, um, the future of the California economy, of the Los Angeles economy. Children cannot afford to return here. No one can afford to buy a house. People like me can't really afford to sell our house because we couldn't, we couldn't buy another house. So that means that the normal sort of churning over mm -hmm. isn't really happening. And so whatever degree you're experiencing, we're finding that that is a common theme across all of our uh, institutions, no matter you know, where they are in LA County, which is huge. And we have these big races coming up. So on Sunday, actually, we have an assembly with candidates for um, mayor and supervisor. We left it to those two positions because we've also in our research actions identified that the two don't play nicely together at all. It's completely lack of, it, it's, it's actually heartbreaking when you see the dysfunction, when you're actually paying attention to it, which leads us to be able to realize that there's no one savior who's gonna come in and save us, even how, how many millions of dollars a certain politician may be spending. <laughs> to become our mayor, we, we've realized that. So we have very specific asks for this first round. You know, one is going to be, we want to double the amount of mental health beds in the county. Another one is where we really want to look into a master lease program for LA. We also want the candidates to put us in touch with, with employers in LA County who do have good high paying jobs with a livable wage and to see how we can maybe come up with training programs and attach people uh, that way. And then the healthcare deserts, we're very concerned, right, with the expansion of Medi-Cal. We don't even have enough pro providers for the patients that we have. So we are partnering with, with people to try and get um, MSWs who are not paid by Medicaid to be allowed to bill because that would automatically expand the amount of therapists that people could see um, as well as come up with training programs. So that's kind of where we are. So we're at an exciting place and our next step coming out of this will be really digging into the economy piece. Sorry, I know I'm supposed to do something now, right? Oh, no, 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 that's no. okay. No, we're just, you know, we're just <laughs> talking about what we've been doing. There's actually yeah. quite a bit of overlap I'll just mention a few areas that we and MOC have worked on that, that might be different, but there's actually more overlap than not. Um, and initially, um, we worked on um, towing and impoundment. Uh, people in certain uh, neighborhoods who uh, 
could not afford really to pay the fees when their vehicles were towed or impounded um, had a terrible vicious circle of losing losing their cars and, and then fees kept racking up and they couldn't get them. And we also did a lot of work on relationships between police and immigrants, including getting an agreement from the San Rafael police uh, not to work with ICE, which were uh, acting in a discriminatory way. And we also worked on, uh, and still do, on aging and disability. Um, and in, in terms of economic uh, matters, one area that we worked on is uh, making earned income tax available to all taxpayers. There were, there were discriminatory rules there in place. Uh, but there's a lot of overlap. You mentioned uh, housing and homelessness, and um, you know we could break it down into uh, affordable and accessible housing as one area. And uh, we played a big role in, um, in uh, approval and construction of Victory Village and also uh, for the Dominican sisters who are also one of the founding members as is MOC, as is Koshofar in uh, MOC uh, in being able to bring some um, otherwise unhoused people into their uh, building. And we've done a lot of work with renter protection um, that included doing some neighborhood walks where we heard these uh, just heart-wrenching stories of people uh, being evict, uh, having uh, rents raised way beyond uh, cost of living and above what they could afford. Uh, and then if they complained, they'd be threatened with a deportation if they were undocumented. Um, and, uh, ref and landlords refusing to do the most basic repairs or uh, you know, leaking uh, leaks and uh, cockroaches and, and all kinds of awful things. And so between the neighborhood walks and house meetings, um, we ended up uh, learning about this and then fight it, working, fighting really hard and successfully passing three uh, basic uh, renter ordinances at the county level and in uh, two of the larger cities in Marin. And we're continuing that work uh, throughout the rest of the county. And then uh, people experiencing homelessness, we had in place um, rotating emergency shelter uh, team where synagogues and churches would, uh, on a rotating basis, house uh, people experiencing homelessness. And that was done for, I think, like 10 years. And then eventually we moved to a housing focused shelter plan um, that had a lot of um, positive experiences in other areas. And then with the passage of uh, Project Home Key in California, um, we were able to get involved in that and converting motels into permanent supportive housing uh, for two sites in Marin, and hopefully there'll be many more. And then you mentioned access to health care. Um, so after the Affordable Care Act passed, we recognized that there were a lot of people who weren't going to be aware of uh, how to sign up. Or, and so we did a whole campaign involving individuals and also legislation and pressured the County of Marin uh, to hire an additional 20 eligibility workers. And we're proud that Marin uh, had one of the highest enrollment rates in uh, in in California. And then, uh, Janet, you also mentioned uh, mental health, and we have focused uh, particularly on mental health for youth. And one thing that we've noticed is that there are huge disparities in the services available to students in the more affluent school districts from the less affluent school districts. And the more affluent, as you might imagine, there are counselors that are hired and teachers are aware of it and are able to refer students. And that just has not been available. So the, the inequities are a big problem. And there's been a very active mental health uh, youth team uh, working on that. Uh, so there's a lot of overlap between what our two organizations have been doing. It's very important work. 
This is so great because when we've been on the bit on bigger actions where we've had a lot of organizations from throughout the state, we don't always have the opportunity to have these kind of more intimate discussions to kind of look at um, two IAF chapters and how they're kind of carrying out the work. So it's so wonderful. I am realizing, thank you to Gail, that mm. when I put this together, I kind of mm. left myself out of the last question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you know, that kind of happened. So I'll really quickly just comment about how I got involved in organizing. And then um, I have, you know, Dara and I have some more questions for each other. So, um, you know, I was, as I mentioned at Temple Beth Am in Los Angeles, and one day my senior rabbi walked into my study and he said, I want you to clear your calendar, whatever, next Wednesday, because there's a conference run by Jewish Funds for Justice at Sinai Temple, a neighboring, you know, synagogue there. I want you to clear your calendar and go. I think it's something important that we need to be involved in. I'm like, oh, really? Like, oh, that's so hard to clear my calendar. So, um, but I respected my senior rabbi and I said, okay, that's what I'll do. So I found myself at Sinai Temple for the day with um, many, many wonderful leaders. Um, one, some people from Kol Shafar might realize this, might not. One of the leaders that day who came to speak was Rabbi Levi Darby, who had come down from Congregation Kol Shofar to share his experience of what it meant to organize his neighborhood in the face of opposition from the city of Tiburon about the Kol Shofar building project um, to redo our synagogue. Um, and this was, of course, you know, well, well before I had even considered um, coming north at all. Um, to Kol Shofar, and so, and there were many other amazing people there that day, in, including Ernie Cortez of IAF, and other people, Sister Mary Beth Larkin, um, and other wonderful organizers. So, fast forward, it took me about five or six hours of being at this conference, and I got it mostly when I left, but it was really when Sister Mary Beth Larkin, one of the 1LA organizers at that time, came and spent not just one meeting with me, but she came and met with me multiple times. And I could see that there wasn't, it wasn't this kind of thing where she was trying to get me involved in a program. She wasn't trying to close me there. She wasn't talking to me about dues. It wasn't about that at all. It was about me really understanding, as Dara pointed out, that this is not a program and that actually communities are not lifted higher and made more holy by the more programs they offer. That is not what makes a community strong and vital. What makes a community strong and vital is the relationships that then give birth to all kinds, and it might be a program later, um, but all kinds of action in the world and meaning and the type of deep roots that Janet talked about too. And I know others on this call feel. And so it's really, it was a combination of going to that conference. By the way, Jewish Funds for Justice no longer exists. They merged with the Progressive Jewish Alliance and they are now Bend the Ark. So that's kind of who I have to thank. And of course, Rabbi Joel Rembaum for sending me to the conference in the first place. So um, I guided our synagogue um, to become members of 1LA. It was not easy. People did not want to get involved in politics. Um, and I really didn't actually have the support of my senior staff leadership at that time. It was kind of like, well, if this is your thing, Rabbi Leiter, go ahead, talk to the board about it. I'm like, okay. Um, but the board felt strongly enough about it. And so there, there it launched. So, um, so I'll pause there. Thank you for letting me slip that in. No, it's <laughs> great. Wonderful. And so there's such a focus, I agree, on... Um, people over programs. That if you start with people, um, fundamentally the way that you do justice can change and it doesn't replace anything. It just sort of says there's a different way to accomplish some of these same goals, whether it's this aspirational dream of tikkun olam or of personal transformation. Um, one of the things I'm curious about for you, Susan, in your congregation is like, how did the pandemic change organizing or conversely, how was organizing exactly what you needed during the pandemic? 
Um, because one could say everything got thrown up in the air, but I'm curious sort of what the last two years has done to this practice within Kol Shafar. Well, so many people on this call responsible for incredible pivoting. So, of course, one of the things that it did is that um, people who could and people who had the support, and I mean institutions and groups of people, could pivot and go virtual. And this, this group did an amazing job. I mean, all of a sudden we were in these statewide actions and just and seeing the numbers. And I also think that the, um, the politicians at the state level were able to take notice of us in a different way. Um, in a, and, and others could, could dispute or support that in the, in the Q and A section or comment section. But I just felt that was, that was really powerful. And we refused to let um, being in a, sh in a shelter in place, you know, stop from, stop from the organizing. I think the other, the other, the flip side of it is that it was an incredibly important time to try to remind our communities exactly what you just said, Dara, which is people come first. So we're in a pandemic and the most important thing that we can do is to check in with each other. You don't have to have an agenda. You don't have to have an ask. You don't have to have a program or a script. You just really need to take that, what we call, and I know Mark will talk about this at some point because it's near and dear to his heart, is panimo pani, face to face. And, um, and I think what suffered during the pandemic is leaders forgot how to do that. Um, and that pains me to say it, but I think that people just got afraid, they got tired. And um, I've had some conversations about this with some of the people on this call that we actually have to go back to those original principles and relearn some of them since the pandemic. So that answer is all over the place, but um, you know, you know, and so what do you think? I mean, how about you? Did any of that resonate or do you have a different take? On definitely, that? definitely. Well, I'll, I'm going to pitch it to Janet in a second, but I, I would just say that um, we also, and I feel like as the senior rabbi, newly minted, by the way, it was literally like, they're like, become a senior <laughs> rabbi, deal with the pandemic. <laughs> so I was like, great timing. Um, I just think that the thing I had to rely on was we had to immediately check in and connect with people. We 100% like forget, I'm, I'm going to throw religious school under the bus for just a second, forget religious school classes. <laughs> like, what do people actually need right now? Forget the idea that like, well, we've always done bar mitzvah this way. What are people telling us? And how do we really learn to listen without already imposing our sense of what their story must mean? Like, let it be interpreted. Let's hear collectively. And, so I just think at the core of one of our key tools for survival in the midst of the entire world turning upside down was the belief that first and foremost, get back in relationship, understand where your neighbor is at, figure out the questions that will elicit their story, and then find a way to bring all those stories back to a group of trusted individuals who can then collectively interpret what are we actually hearing so that we know what we wanna move through to do next. Um, and that for me, like, isn't always about homelessness. It, it sometimes is about elderly members of the community feeling isolated and scared. It's about bar mitzvah families, apoplectic, the, the, the thing that they planned, <laughs> you know, that those are real issues. And if you start working on those issues, then you can actually launch to even bigger issues next time, uh, once you've built up that trust and that dialogue. So Janet, I'm curious, because we, we went through this together, like, what were some of the highlight moments where you saw organizing like saving us for the last two years? So I remember right at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, Dara said that sort of we should think of of any way we could to help Isaiahs feel supported and to stay connected. And we were going to do really whatever it took. And how um, the IAF organizing piece was really helpful to us is that I'm sure many of you have been to them, civic academies. So we quickly put together civic academies on how to use Zoom. And each institution could then teach that to their communities. Um, if they didn't have access to computers, we figured out FaceTime on a phone and we taught them about that. So first of all, we, we worked really hard. We would phone people, obviously, but we wanted to make sure that if we were going to offer an opportunity to get together, that everybody knew. 
And that could be challenging at times because it might take two hours before someone felt uh, comfortable um, with Zoom. And as you know, we all still have challenges with our mute buttons, let's face it, but it was a lot worse. It was a lot worse back then. And then I think as we were having um, basically house meetings, we used that sort of way of organizing for any large traumatic event that happened. So the first one happened to be the murder of George Floyd. And we put out a call for two separate days. Both of our rabbis were there. I was there. And you could come to both if you wanted, or you could come to the either or. And it was just an opportunity for people to break into small groups and to just share what they were feeling. There was a lot of shock, which I was very surprised at. But, um, you know, we out of that, we then realized that people were interested in learning a bit more about what privilege looked like. Dara, yes. Well, and I just want to add to, because I had forgotten this, like, every rabbi and every lay leader in like the network of people were trying to like figure out what was the program after George Floyd's murder and the subsequent, you know, gatherings, public gatherings, everyone wanted to know, like, what do we do for the congregation? And I felt like we really held ourselves in check by starting with what are people telling us? What are their questions? And more importantly, and Janet, you did a great job holding back on this. We had a thousand ideas <laughs> and we said, after the first two to three house meetings and a gathering of people who said, no, we really are interested. We really tried to put it back into their hands and say, we, we're, we can do trainings, we can help you. But if you really want to start a book group, this lets you, we are gonna empower you to start the book group. And then you could see certain people were very committed, but many were, were looking to receive. And that actually wasn't gonna meet the ultimate goal of societal transformation that all of them spoke about. Just wanted to interrupt with that. <laughs> No, that's so true, right? We, we, I had a rule, six times, I'm gonna do it for you six times. Uh, and that could be many different things. We had civics in the synagogue, we had um, anti-racist sort of groups. We, we had Isaiahs helping Isaiahs, which I think came directly out of organizing, which is looking through our um, membership and getting all the therapists and doc, you know, people in, in and ask them, you know, it's not gonna be therapy, but you know, when Israel was erupting, can you handle helping people process their, their feelings and their thoughts in a respectful way? And that, that, that was very sort of uh, powerful. But also uh, the ability to let go. I think that's what organizing has taught me over the years. Sometimes you, you think that you've got someone and you, you've had the 25th one-to-one -one and then you realize they really they had no interest in ever doing anything, but they like having coffee with you. I've got a little bit better at, at realizing that this isn't for everyone um, and that I only have so much time. Dara only has. I'm very, I try to protect Dara. I think that's also part of my role, not, not have her have to do everything. Um, and then move on to the next thing all the time, really trying to, when people said, oh, but I don't know any black people. Well, you know what? We work with a lot of black people and we have really deep and meaningful and, and relationships that can stand, withstand friction that are not like Pollyanna-ish. Yeah. We've had a few people who've shown up, but not a lot, but we continue. Building leaders is slow, it's slow it's work, slow. right? Slow and long work. But Mark, I'd love to, as I was listening to Janet and Dara talk about that, um, I don't, I know you'd like to share a little bit about some of the interfaith stuff. And it sounds similar in the sense of being poised to support. Yeah, it does. I think it is similar. Um, so uh, this goes back to this, um, the neo-Nazis in Whitefish, Montana, in, I don't know if that was 2016. 2017. 2017. Mm -hmm. um, it was a terrifying, horrible uh, situation where people's lives were being threatened. And it, it, it was horrible, not only because of the impact on particular individuals there, Jewish individuals who were being targeted, but like, is this what our society is becoming? Is this going to be tolerated? by local politicians and police and the communities. And something really beautiful happened there, which is that some people 
organized and uh, coined the phrase, love lives here. And then Rabbi Leiter, you and a number of other uh, members of the clergy visited in solidarity and also I, I think to learn. And, and you brought that back. And I believe it was you who coined the phrase love lives in Moran, which under the auspices of the Marin Interfaith Council, um, you know, became a thing that that still exists and is quite important. And um, after the violence in uh, Charlottesville, uh, also, you know, white supremacists, um, you were very quickly able to bring together uh, faith leaders uh, throughout the county and congregants, and we pretty much packed our, you know, 500 person uh, big Knesset. Uh, it was a very, very moving service. And there's no way that that could have happened if there weren't already relationships that have been built up through organizing. So well, you know, was, I, re yeah. I remember Mark that night because what we did based on MOC um, sensibilities and, and IAF sensibilities is we actually had people hold up institutional signs. Mm. Yeah. So we were actually kind of um, check doing a check in, even in a pastoral sense. That's and right. there were, I don't remember, I feel like there were like 36 or 40 institutions represented that night. Hmm. But that's a different, that's another way of counting, as it were, right? Like saying, not only are we 500 people, but we're like, wow, this is a broad base. But, and Mark was one of those um, facilitators who has been called upon and has moved actually and quickly along with others on this call to hold people in exactly that way that you described, Dara, which is to, you know, to be there to, to, to just ask the questions and to receive what people are needing instead of feeling like we have to produce right away. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Dara, there's like a kind of a white elephant in the room, don't you think? Like, I, I think that, <laughs> We have amazing, amazing leaders on this call. And this organizing can get like a little complicated, right? Like clergy and amazing lay leaders. And yeah. are you nodding your head about that? Is that something we want to? I mean, I mean, I just feel like just to spice it up a little bit, um, you know, the, the best and the worst thing that a synagogue can do is introduce organizing. <laughs> because number one, those IAF leaders, the, um, the, the, not the leaders, I'll go with the organizers first, because, you know, and I think Liz is an organizer, right? So like, <laughs> I feel like we'll give her a shout out. They are meant to come in and agitate. Like, this is not like, oh, Rabbi, you're so smart. Oh, Rabbi, I loved your sermon. Oh, Rabbi, my kids bought mitzvah was the most meaningful thing. They're like, you said you cared about unhoused people and you haven't done anything about it. <laughs> or... I asked you, you know, to really dig deep and I'm hearing a surface level story. I felt like I have never been called to task like I am when I am with professionally trained organizers who are not interested in making me feel great about myself, which is a very congregant, Janet, Janet knows by now, she doesn't have to do this. Like, I'm just gonna tell you how it is because I, I, you wanna change the world and you said you wanted to do it this way. Are you ready to have an authentic, real, uncomfortable conversation about it? And you know, again, I didn't choose the job because I needed accolade, but it's a nice perk of being a rabbi when everyone's like, we're so happy you're here. Will you be available for me always? Um, so that's number one. Organizers really stir the pot. Um, and number two is once your congregants, Isaiah members like Janet have been trained and are confident and fully versed, um, they can go out organize you. So I could have hypothetically like a great dream of, um, here's an example that hasn't happened yet. Um, uh, my great dream is like reproductive rights should be at the center of our organizing for the next until we can make sure the Supreme Court's gonna protect it, right? I, super clear. And I can give sermon after sermon about it and I can make sure every bat mitzvah talks about it. But if Janet and her team organize the community in a more effective way than me just giving sermons or sending emails. And they say, no, the presenting issue is actually the California economy. And we just turned out 500 congregants who are gonna tell you stories and ask you to prioritize your time 
to address the economy, I, I mean, I have two choices. I could look really bad as the leader of this community, or I'm going to change my, my perspective and I'm going to pivot my focus. That's essentially what we're doing with politicians all the time. Like you thought you could just pat us on the head and say, nice job. We're so, thank you for visiting. And then you turn out powerfully a whole bunch of people and you have to change your priorities. So I think that's where if the traditional hierarchy is a rabbi was hired to be inspirational and a rabbi was hired to sound the call of Torah and justice. But in fact, the new model and the ones that we really didn't get trained for in school are about teaching the community to collectively use their voice and almost not take over the pulpit, but replace the pulpit with something that's far more impactful and enduring. We have to be ready for that as a board and as employees, uh, because that that's the biggest risk. Like we think this is actually the, the better way to move forward as a Jewish community. Yeah, great, real grassroots. And I think for me, what the issue that I've struggled with here and people on this call know this is a deep desire to want to build relationships and organize in Marin City, a traditionally African American Black neighborhood in our county. And it's been a real challenge because until that really surfaces in our community as being one of the top um, you know, issues that people are really willing to organize. I'm not saying they're not passionate about it. They're not interested. It, it keeps them up at night. They care. But that's different than some type of action coming through that can be um, realized and moved forward. And, you know, so it's, I get, we would march alone, Dara, right? <laughs> if we just... Um, you know, so the type of individual organizing that I've done in Marin City looks very, very different and gets, frankly, a lot less of my attention than MOC organizing, which is as it should be, because this is where my people are, right? These are the issues that are, have been vetted and have come up, come up through the people. Um, so I wanted to just put a kind of one plug into the... Um, the chat, some people here have been to a Bay Area week-long training for leaders at a seminary that is Church of the Divinity over in Berkeley. And I just wanted to put a link in and please know that the link I'm putting in um, is indeed from 2020. Yes, from a training that took place in 2020 before COVID, um, and Janet was asking me earlier, she's like, is that going to be in person this year? Maybe Liz knows, I don't know, but it's only May and that's a long time between now and January. <laughs> so Liz, please unmute yourself if you'd like to share. Yeah. Well, actually it's so funny. You should say this because, um, so I have been doing some work with with CDSP, they actually started a core team during the pandemic. So they've been asking this question of themselves, what does organizing look like beyond this January course? And uh, we are planning to do it in person next January. It's always Martin Luther King week. So that's a, this is a great plug to, to come to that. It's a wonderful training. Um, and they have made the IAF training a graduation requirement for all seminarians. So it's also an action on the Episcopal Church in a way, and their future clergy. Um, we should do this at all seminaries, honestly. Um, but they've decided because that they're realizing this is their next September, they're going to have a student body that none of the students have been to this course in person. So they've decided to do a one day organizing training on September 30th. Um, as kind of a, an intro to broad-based organizing. It'll, it's a Friday, it'll be nine to five or something like that. I don't have any idea if that's a terrible day with the Jewish hol high holidays. So it might be the worst possible day for us to do it for you, but, um, but they are gonna be doing a training in September and then we will have the January class again. Thank you, Liz. I'm glad I threw it in there. I was somewhat apologetic because it was old, but on the other hand, it's aspirational. And we're also doing IAF five-day training in Denver this July. So that's a much more, um, much sooner opportunity to. Wonderful. So people from LA and Marin can reconnect in person, either 
either in the East Bay or in Denver. So um, I just wanted to um, open up the chat for people who would like to put any questions or comments in. And if you prefer and you're okay with being recorded um, visually and, and your voice, uh, then please unmute yourself if there's anything you'd like to share in our last few minutes together. Okay, I can't believe it. Anybody else from our fireside chat group want to share any closing thoughts or things that came up for them in the last little bit? Well, maybe maybe this is just a, a brief comment, but um, I, I've appreciated the the trainings uh, using the language of, of the art of conversation, and that it's. It's not a, a widely practiced or appreciated art. Um, of course, the pandemic made things very challenging. Um, meeting remotely was certainly better than not meeting or making each other sick. Um, but you know, we live in a society where, to a large degree, people don't really speak and listen from the heart in an open-minded way people don't usually share stories that are that they really feel in their heart it's much more topical it's much more sound bites you know it's consistent with the media and technology and it's just an extremely important uh, concept and thing to practice and um, i mean the results are are astonishing and it's it's just worth renaming and, and repracticing again and again in this world in which people are in a room together and the majority are on their cell phones most of the time, you know? So or true. just arguing and, you know, we're, we're like this idea, no, that idea, no, this idea, but well, like, where does that come from in you? Why is that important to you? Tell us a story of, why that matters to you. And it's a whole different experience, a true conversation. Gail, you were raising your hand, but you're muted. You should unmute yourself, Gail. <clears throat> One of the things I've loved about my engagement with IAF and MOC and Panim El Panim is the talking and meeting people. I mean, you just don't know who's sitting in front of you. And I think that uh, because we're together, that is, across institutions, across churches, across nonprofits, I mean, I've met people I never would have met in my whole entire life. Uh, certainly, I'm a Jewish educator. I never would have met them. I only met Jews. So this has been just I never knew what was a parochial vicar. I didn't really understand what was a deacon. I mean, there were so many things I didn't understand. And the way in which people organize both their religious life, their internal life, their spiritual life, it's just been a joy. And I, um, when I think about the people that I've met, they're in a way, some of the people I like the best in the whole community. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, um, that was a big surprise. Do you know what I mean? I, I didn't anticipate that, but it's turned out to be continuously true. And we rabbis are not really allowed to say that, Gail, but, but. <laughs> Which thing aren't you allowed to say? That these are the best people. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. I think the thing about one-to-ones, is that what you call the relational conversation? We're a bit more um, one-to-ones, we call them, but uh, our organizing team was really good at doing that. And we held each other accountable and that definitely suffered during um, COVID. We, we just weren't as disciplined. We were thinking about a, a lot of things for a lot of people. And so I stepped down from the V, v I go back to just caring about Amsetic. Um, and that I was talking to Dara, that's our first goal is to get back to having these discipline because you're right. Um, they just, people, why do you want to meet with me? I just want to get to know you. Really? You're not going to ask me to do something. There's this level of suspicion 
uh, that you can do away with in five seconds. That's just really rewarding. And you get to know someone. And I think the piece for me that's been so liberating is the concept of a public person, because I like everybody to like me. <laughs> that, can, that can be exhausting. So once I realized that it's fine to have people who don't like you, that also has been very, very life-changing for me. And it's probably the answer to the polarization that we experience in society now, right? Which is really so important. So it looks like Dear did a TEDx talk on organizing. Oh, she food. did, yes. She it was that. great. Just popped it into the chat. So, um, so I want to say thank you to everybody tonight. It's so nice for me to know that because of the nature of organizing and all of the, um, the facets that we've talked about, right, clergy roles, lay leadership, that for me as a person who wants to stay involved in community organizing, that there's going to be so many opportunities for me to do that, um, whatever the path is ahead for me. Um, I have shared with some of you that I'm going to be spending some time out in the Sacramento area this coming year on a kind of a temporary basis um, with some family out there and, um, you know, thinking about, well, what does it look like? What's going on with organizing in Sacramento, right? And how can I, even in a brief time, um, you know, be a part of that, learn about it, um, get to know people in the way that Gail talked about in such a meaningful and important and cur a way of curiosity. So, um, so I want to thank Amdira for being with us tonight, Janet, Mark, it was such a pleasure. And I appreciate all the time you put into making this possible. Thank you to Liz Hall, our organizer, and to everyone here on this call, many of whom I know, a couple, not sure, but um, grateful that you're here tonight and hope that you'll join us two weeks from tonight for the last fireside chat um, with Rabbi Adam Greenwald of American Jewish University, the Miller Introduction to Judaism program. So thank you so much and good night. Bye everybody. Thank you for inviting us. You are welcome.